Rutgers has. I'm excited to meet that new baby. It's not very pretty. Does he look pretty in the pictures on Facebook? Were those, were those photoshopped or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pretty baby. I'm kidding. Does he look like a pretty cute baby? And most newborns are not. I agree. But you look pretty photogenic. Takes over his grandpa. Is that where it is? Got yeah, I forgot things. about that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here this morning. Appreciate you coming for Sunday school. <coughs> So here we're, we've been in uh, the book of Acts for uh, quite a while, and we're getting down to the last, this is the last lesson in my Sunday school book. Be, it's called Be Daring is the name of my Sunday school book. It's a weird book. And it covers two chapters, though, so I'm not sure how far we'll get. Hopefully we'll get through. But, um, so it might be the last or second to the last uh, Sunday school lesson in the book of Acts. I've enjoyed Acts. Acts is a kind of like... How I think of as the Gospel of Mark, there's a lot of action and go, 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 do, do, do. And so it's interesting. It's easy to read for somebody like me with the shortest attention span. It's fun and easy to read because it's got a lot of action. It's just not just all teaching. And so it's easier for me to pay attention to that kind of, you know, narrative for longer. And there's a lot of interesting exploits and things like that in it that are fun to read. And, and you, there's also some doctrine and you learn things and it's important to see these early Christians and how they acted and why some of the reasons why their churches were successful and why their churches spread and grew. And so how we can it can help us be better Christians and be better a better church from that. And so uh, to, to put you kind of in mind of the setting of where we are at in today's chapter, starting verse, chapter 27, verse 1, is Paul has already been, remember, arrested and he got put in uh, captivity in the castle in Caesarea for a couple of years. A new governor came to town, decided we need to do something with this guy, so they had another hearing and asked him if he wanted to go back to Jerusalem for a trial, and he said, no, I appeal unto Caesar. And so he got to be a witness to King Agrippa and, and Festus. And then they said, okay, if, if you appeal unto Caesar, then to, unto Caesar you shall go. So that, that brings us to chapter 27, verse 1. There began the journey to Rome. And Paul knew he was going to Rome. God had promised him that one day he'd be able to minister in Rome. And so he just didn't know that it was going to be as a prisoner um, under, you know, under guard going to Rome. But he's, uh, you know, you know, this last uh, couple chapters is pretty eventful. And, uh, uh, but, but Paul, through all of this, you know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of turmoil and stuff going through. Through all of this, he's a, he's trusted God. He's God promised him all the way back. And I'll read it to you. Acts 23, verse 11, I think. And, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified me, of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. It's all, so Paul held on to that promise, didn't he? So when the, you know, the seas were churning and you know, crowds around him were threatening and whatever it was that he was going through, he trusted God's promise, didn't he? He knew that God told him he was going to be in Rome, didn't know how, but he knew that he wasn't going to get killed or anything like that before he got there. He just trusted God. And, you know, if you look at the, I believe it was Moses, you know, when it got time for him to die, and, you know, he gathered up himself and he was in bed and telling his last saying. I remember one of the, and that's one of my favorite kind of passages in the Bible. Moses told the people everything that God promised me, he did. He, he kept all of his promises. To me, and now that I'm old, I guess he, when he was 120 years old, he died. You know, I, I can say that God has always been a keeper of his promises, and I'm glad I, can, I personally can say that too. Amen. Yeah. That God's always kept his promises. He's never failed me. He's never forsaken me. He's always been true to his word and faithful. Amen. And he's always seen me through everything I've gone through, as well as um, you know, the, the, back to the story here, as, as well as he did for Paul. And so. Luke here, the writer of Acts, you know, has a pretty long section on this, this journey between Caesarea, which is a coastal city, and into Rome. 
And so he, you know, he, he, he's going to give an accurate history of it. And I've always kind of liked shipping, and I don't know why, but I like reading books about historical fiction about the, the Navy and, the, you know, even back in the Napoleonic area, the early days where they, you know, really, really got good at shipping large ships and having fights and the, the cannons and stuff like that. There's some pretty amazing stories in that part of history. So somehow I got, I read, you know, a book or two and they just got kind of interested. So, and, and I've read a lot of that kind of stuff. So it's always been really interesting to me. So I like this too, just from a personal standpoint. But, you know, Paul, you know, Luke wanted to describe, you know, he's an accurate historian. He, he mostly though, he's going to present Paul as a courageous leader. There's a saying you know, Paul started out this journey as a prisoner. He ended up as the captain. You know, by the time you get to the end of the story, he's calling the shots and he's telling the captain and the the, the uh, centurion what to do. And they obey his orders. And he ends up saving 276 men by the time the, this little story is over. So it's pretty cool. You know, uh, sometimes we picture, you know, sea journeys as kind of a metaphor of life, don't we? You know, we tell people bon voyage, and you know, you know, we, we have sayings like seek or swim, or you know, if somebody dies, well, they made it to the other shore, you know, things like that. We have a lot of cliches and sayings and metaphors about uh, you know comparing life to a journey, and that's not what this is. This isn't some kind of allegory that we can take and say, oh, this has a deeper meaning, but it does kind of have a lot of correlations to life too, and it's interesting to we'll point it out just kind of applications. The first section, there's about four sections. The first one is Paul the Counselor, and that's in chapter number 27, in the first 20 verses. So let's read the first 20 verses. Like I said, this is, this is fun and easy to read because it's a very interesting narrative, so bear with me. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, when Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, Thessalonica being with us, Aristarchus is going to be mentioned several times in Paul's writings, and the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed into Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia, Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Canidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it came into a place which is called the Fair Havens. Nine were and two was the city of Lacia. Now when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. So here we got Paul the counselor, right? Verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than these things which were spoken of by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence, if by any means they might attain into <coughs> Phoenice, and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. And when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into quicksands, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with their own hands the tackling of the ship. And, and when neither sun nor stars for many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us. All the hope that we should be saved was then taken away. You know, one thing there, you know, I always mention that this is not an allegory. There's no, like, deeper meaning. One thing many preachers and scholars have pointed out 
that is a deeper meaning is that phase, that phrase, we let her drive. <laughs> and uh, and it's a, I'm talking about women drivers. And so you can see all the trouble that that caused once, the, once they let her drive, right? And so and that was, I, was, I learned that at Baptist Bible College, so you, you have to say, take that as the gospel truth. So anyways, um, back at the beginning, you, you can see the, the point of the, the, the Sunday School book, the point that Paul started out kind of like a counselor, right? That was his, his kind of mode in this first part of the story. He counsels, okay, don't do this. This is going to be a mistake. So uh, did they listen to him? No. People still today don't listen to the Apostle Paul, do they? And so the, 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 the Bible says here in the first verse, they, they deliver Paul. And then it says certain other prisoners, in, in other words, prisoners, different kinds of prisoners than Paul was. He, he didn't even really have a charge, did he? They didn't even know what to charge him with and, or what he did. They're sending him up because he appealed. These other prisoners, if you read the Greek, it's like these other kinds of prisoners. Probably some of them were actually going to get beheaded. You know, they had been sentenced to death. We don't know that, sir, but commonly that kind of thing happened. And so uh, the, the, Paul wasn't the only prisoner. And then, of course, it mentions there that there was a Aristarchus. Aristarchus is mentioned quite a few times in the New Testament for a guy that we don't know who it is. You know, when you hear the word Aristarchus, that doesn't ring a familiar bell. Like, oh, you know, I know that name. Like Timothy and Tychicus and some of these that are more well known, but he's actually mentioned quite a few times in the Bible, and three times in Acts, and I think over there in uh, Colossians chapter 14, which is a, uh, if you remember, Colossians is one of the four what we call prison epistles, right? He wrote it from Rome as a prisoner, and he calls Aristarchus a fellow prisoner, and so we don't know that Aristarchus ever got charged or anything, but he's actually staying there basically with Paul, you know, comforting him and stuff. So pretty pretty awesome Christian guy here that we don't hear very often or don't know too much about, but sounds like a really good Christian man and a, uh, somebody that was just a super huge blessing to Paul. So they start off sailing, and, and, and uh, Caesarea is on the coast of Israel. They're going north, right? And they're going north, of, you know, the first about 80 miles, and they stop at a little city, and they go north a little bit and stop at another city. And that city, I think, was Sidon, and, 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 or, or, no, Sidon was the first city, and Paul was permitted to visit his friends there. It's, we don't have a record of him ever having been to Sidon, but the, because of the kindness of the Roman officer allowing him to refresh himself and meet uh, w with encouragement. We don't know who these believers are, but they were able to, to be a blessing to Paul, too. And sometimes, you know... Uh, you know, you, you, when you get a chance just to be a blessing to somebody, that's going to be remembered someday, isn't it, in heaven? When, when, and the Bible says that he's going to review all that we ever did, good or bad, and, and make that judgment based on what crowns we're going to get. And You know, your name might not be mentioned very much, and you might do some ministry in the church or, or help somebody out, and nobody might even notice or take notice or publicly mention it. But, you know, God sees all that, doesn't he? And he knows and that's the main thing. I want, I'd rather be that way, wouldn't you? Right. I'd rather get my reward there than be reward, rewarded here. And so, but God does know. You know, and there's not a single thing, even giving a cup of, of, of water to to a missionary or somebody that's being a witness. You know, God God sees all of that and will reward it. And so, that that's that's as far as we know, these believers in Sidon's that's the only mention they ever get in the in the uh, whole Bible is that they were an encouragement and a blessing to Paul. And no doubt Aristarchus and those with him. And Luke is also with him because he's gone back to saying, we, again, we were we went set out and we shipped and then we went here. So Luke joins and leaves and joins and leaves throughout Acts. And then when he rejoins, he always starts using that pronoun, that we. And so we know right now during this voyage, Luke is also with Paul and Aristarchus. So they went, they transitioned there from a small little coastal Boaty ship to a large ship, says from Alexandria. What did they do in Alexandria for the Rome for the Romans? Does anybody know? They kind of mentioned. Do you remember Dan? Were they like, were they getting wheat? Yeah, that's where Alexandria was. Where they got their wheat. They fed most of the Roman world from Alexandria. So there was 
just these countless grain bargy sailboats that just constantly went back and forth to the different major cities and major ports of Rome. They, they called it the breadbasket of Rome, Alexandria. And so they actually got on one of these big grain ships, a big ship that held at least 276 people. That's quite a big boat, isn't it? And especially back in the first century, you know. And so probably a lot safer if you got caught in a storm being one of those than one of those smaller little coastal boats that, you know, just 10 or 20 or 30 people, right? So, before now, they're just going north along the coast. But now they're going to strike off and try to start heading across the Mediterranean towards Italy. And uh, the Bible <coughs> says they went under Cyprus. I'll pick up the story here in verse number 4. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus. That just means south of the island, right, if you're looking at the map because the winds were contrary. And they sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, Tamyra, Galicia, and they, that, oh, that's where they found the big ship and put us therein. And they slowed, they, you know, they, they started ships. The ships started going really slowly because the, the winds were scarce and, and uh, they weren't just, you know, weren't favorable winds. But they got to the island of Crete. Crete is shaped roughly like a long rectangle. And of course it's got nooks and crags and bays and outlets and inlets and things like that. But it's shaped roughly about like this, right? And so when they get to the, they're going along the south of it and then they're going to go that way to Italy. I'm doing it backwards. That way to Italy, right? Yeah. Italy's way over here. And so they're coming from this direction and they get to the south and they get to the very middle, almost exactly in the bottom center. South is that little town called Fair Havens. And it's a little bay there. But the bay wasn't shaped very good for wintering in. You know, it wasn't very protected from the, all the different winds like the one, the Uroc, the Dun, and things like that. So it wasn't that the city couldn't winter. You know, we got that, uh, uh, we, we get down there to verse 12. It says it was not commodious to winter in. It wasn't just that there wasn't hotels and grocery stores and places for them to <coughs> accommodate. It was the shape of the bay. It wasn't very good for that a ship of that size to protect it. You, sometimes bays are good, you know, from the south, but they're not that good from, you know, you know what I'm saying? And uh, sailors have to worry about that kind of thing. And so they're like, okay, well, all they had to do, see, we're looking at Fair Havens. All they were trying to do is go right to here, to Phoenicia, Phoenix, Phoenix, whatever that. That was 40 miles. They weren't sailing off to way off somewhere in the deep blue Mediterranean. All they had to go was 40 miles, just right by the coast. And they're like, just right down here, this bay is a lot better to winter in over here at Phoenix, Phoenicia, Phoenix, whatever it's called. So Paul's like, what did Paul say? Eh -eh. We better not do that. There's danger there. And he gives them that counsel in verse number 10. The voyage will be much hurt. But the master, who was really the expert, right? He had been sailing the Mediterranean for these many years and rose to the point of the master of the ship. And then other people there, you know, the centurion was, you know, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors there are safety. So he didn't just ask Paul and the master. There was others there too. And it says the, the, the more of them said that it should be safe. And then they got some favorable winds. We were sitting in the back. My dad might listen to this, but I'm, I'm not making fun of you, Dad. Wednesday night, he said, what does that little sign say up there in the pulpit? I said, no, it's just a picture of like the, you know, the scene at Bethlehem. <laughs> he thought it was words he was trying to reason. So, anyways, I, I'm making fun of you a little bit, Dad. Sorry. Love you. Anyways, uh, so... It came in handy today, though. The activity decor says somebody paid $4.98 for it back. So don't lose that thing. All right, so uh, the final thing that convinced them, though, it, to, let's go ahead and s to ship down here to Phoenice, is they got a nice, gentle south wind. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, it says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had ordained their purpose, Losing thins, they sailed close by Crete. One time, uh, when I remember on me and Tracy's 10th anniversary, we went to a place and they had these little 
sailboats called Hobie Kanks. Have you all ever heard of those or seen those? It's like two plastic kind of pontoons, about the size of one of these little altar pews. And in the middle is just stretched mesh, like black, almost like trampoline material. You know what I'm talking about? They're built like that, two, two little floaty pontoons with stretch mesh in a sail and a little rudder. And so they, they took us out and just in the little bag, the wind was blowing a little bit, and showed us how, how to do the sail and the rudder. And mainly the sail is that you're, you're you know, using your hands pointed. Mainly you're just tightening or loosening a rope, right? And then if you want to go slower, you loosen it way off where the sail's floppy and you can still control it. And you want to go faster, well, you pull that sail tight where it's closer to the wind. And it the, the, you know, pushes you a lot faster. And they were giving us the rules, you know. And so me and Tracy went out and a little bit and it was fun. And the next day, Tracy had something else to do. I think she was going to the spa or something. So I decided to get one again by myself. And I started going a lot faster, but the waves were choppy. And it didn't take very long at all before I started feeling seasick because <laughs> I couldn't handle the. If you're not used to that, you know, when you're from Oklahoma, a land lover like us, man, it did not take long at all. So I, I, I put it back on the beach and said, I'm done with this. That was the last time I've ever sailed. <laughs> First and last time or second and last time. But uh, I can't imagine, you know, the wind was probably only blowing 10 miles an hour and I thought I was going fast, you know. I can't imagine, you know, getting caught in a really bad storm like that these guys get into but of course they're in a big old big old shit but they're you know they were just trying to go 40 miles and then they were agreeing yeah you're right it's not that bad good of a time to be sailing because the Bible says it was close to the fast and um, um, so that's talking I think about the day of atonement you know, where they would fast. And it, basically in the fall, it starts getting dangerous to sail in the Mediterranean, and in the winter, it gets really dangerous. So they were right at the point where they were right on the edge of, hey, you know, we don't sail this time of year. So they decided to risk it. Anyways, um, when, you're, when you're making a decision, especially a, norm, a big decision like this, you know, we don't know how valuable that load of grain was, but it was, Valuable, you know, it was a big ship, right? And the value of the ship itself and its tackle and the value of all the lives aboard. It was a big decision, wasn't it, to go right at the edge of the, the weather at the time where we don't sail anymore. And so to make that decision and say yes, when, when the Apostle Paul was sitting there and saying, man, don't go because I've got a premonition for the Lord that something bad is going to happen. And so... Sometimes we, get, sometimes we can get ourselves in trouble from, from making poor decisions because we don't first listen to the Lord. Would you agree with that? We don't make, make our decisions based on what would the Lord's will be, you know, and is this, a, is this a good decision based on biblical principles and have we prayed about it and asked the Lord to give us a peace about it um, before we make some of these big life decisions. And we've seen uh, where these people... By not doing that, got into shipwreck, but we've also seen people in their lives kind of shipwreck their lives, too, by making really bad decisions, haven't we? That they've been, I wish they would have prayed and diligently sought God's will before they married that person, right? Or before they went off and moved to that place and decided, hey, I'm going to go work at this place and be away from my family and church and out in, you know, in a precarious place where... For instance, like the military, where they weren't spiritually ready to face the the world and, and all that it you know, being the only Christian in a company of three hundred people you have to live with for four years, they weren't spiritually prepared for that to be the strong witness and win others. And instead they quickly succumbed and they, you know, they come back from the military and they're just you know, they're secular completely, they're not interested in anything in, in the church or in anything, read the Bible, anything Christian at all. That was a bad decision, and I'm not down in the military at all. I'm just saying spiritually, it is a black hole for young people to go in spiritually. They go in, teenage Christian raised in church, y'all been all church, and then they come out, they spin them back out. They don't care. And, and I mean, just about every young person I've ever known of my family and friends that has gone in the military, that's not happening. So I'm not talking about one or two people, I'm talking about everybody I've ever known. 
as a young person. So I would recommend if you're going to go into the military to wait a little bit and go in as a more mature person, maybe once you've married and had kids and, and are established in your faith a little bit more so it won't get shipwrecked by going out and being out in the world. And the, and the military is a little bit worse because you don't just go work there, right? You live with these people, eat with them, train with, you know, and, and so uh, the, I've, known, I've also known some good Christians that were in the military, and, you know, so not all of them are like that, but most of them were the ones that went in older and more mature and stable in their faith and, and uh, were able to, you know, use that as a time where they were able to actually be a witness to others there. We, need, we do need more of that. And so, um, so that kind of decision is what I'm talking about. Big life decisions. You, you, you seek the Lord first. Is it, is it scriptural, you know, what I'm going to do? Is it wise? You know, am I going to go out and be, you know, face dangerous seas spiritually or any other way? And, and, and do I, did I ask counsel of somebody godly, my pastor or my godly grandma, you know? Grandma, what do you think I should do? You know, should I go here or do this, you know? And, and they had one godly person giving advice here, and it was just ignored, and then went with the worldly advice, didn't they? The seemingly expert advice from the world isn't always expert, is it? Sometimes they'll, the experts will tell you that this is what you ought to do, and this is the best thing for you. And, and you know, the, the experts a lot of times don't disagree, don't agree with the Bible, do they? They'll tell you, brother, hey, don't spank your kids ever, you know. That's going to be bad. That's going to harm their psyche, and then they're going to associate you with violence, you know, and things like that. And where the Bible said, boy, if you spare the rod, you hate your child. And so, so you got a choice. Am I going to do what the world says or what the Bible says, you know, in child rearing? And I've seen people make a shipwreck of their child rearing, and you have too, haven't you? Where it turned out that, you know, the children, you know, didn't have the you know, whatever they needed when they got to face the world and, and didn't stick with it. So what I'm saying is, you know, things like this, they were impatient to go, weren't they? One time we were, um, we decided to, we were going to go canoeing, and my brother Bobby and Robbie were here visiting from Georgia. And we wanted to do that uh, <coughs> section of the Little River where you put in at the cattle crossing, and then float down to the state line, and you get out right there at the state line, you know, Cerro Gordo or whatever, and it's a nice little float. You know, if you've never done that, that's a pretty little place to fish. The water's clear and kind of has this greenish hue, because the Little River and the Mountain Fork have already joined there, so, and they're, uh, you know, just a really pretty time to float. So we had two boats. We had a canoe and a little small John boat. It was only like 10 feet long, tiny little John boat. And they had a, a trolling motor and a battery on theirs. We just had paddles. So we, all four of us, it was me and Dad, went, and we were watching the weather. It was in April, and there were storms coming. They were like, man, we better not go. But I really wanted to go. I love canoeing. I really wanted to go fishing. And so we were watching the radar and watching the radar, and it looked like there was a big old split. You know how it seems like a lot of times when we need rain, you can look at the radar, and it'll come like, oh, we're going to get a lot of rain. And then right before it gets there, it just splits and goes around you, right? That's what it looked like it was doing. It had stopped, split, and there was this big old line right where we were in McCurt County where it didn't look like we were in there. So we got down all the way down there, put in our boats, weather was fine, got about a mile down in the water, and boom, you know, started thundering and just pouring down just sheets of rain. I mean, in like seconds, we were soaked to the bone and lightning and everything. So we got the boats and got up on the shore and we're actually holding that little. 10 foot aluminum John boat above our heads trying to protect ourselves from the rain just pouring down in the woods for like an hour and then they quit raining we got back in the water got about a mile down the river again and it started up again had to get all unload the battery and the trolling motor all our equipment hold it above our heads for about an hour and we finally got back in the water that whole day we caught one little bitty striper bass I caught him about that big and I think I just accidentally caught him like it caught on his tail or something you know and so it was the worst fishing day ever. And the main reason that we got in trouble was because of my impatience. I really wanted to go. I wasn't going to take no for an answer. Instead of look, being wise about it and listening to their dad was like, no, we better not go. That looks bad. No, I pushed and pushed and pushed until I got my way. And it ended up being a disaster. We're probably lucky we didn't get struck by lightning. We're not supposed to stand under trees. We were under trees holding aluminum over our head. And so anyways, 
Sometimes we get impatient. We really want our way, don't we? And we want this. We want to achieve this. We want this new thing or new job or we want to make more. We want this relationship to work, you know, really bad. We're lonely. We want that. You know, we need somebody. Have you all seen that before? Somebody, a young person, they want to be married so bad. They just kind of almost get to the point where they'll settle for anything. And then that, what is that? That's a disaster waiting to happen, a shipwreck. And we've seen that before, different ways and different things. Instead of just trusting and waiting on God. And so they got bad advice. They were impatient. They actually, you know, looked at the conditions like I did on that big fishing trip. They said, man, this is ideal. It's, you know, the wind started blowing softly from the south. Man, we only got 40 miles to go. Let's go. And they should have listened to Paul. Um, the Isaiah 28, 16 said, He that believeth shall not make haste. It pays to listen to, to, the, to the Word, doesn't it? And listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to godly advice before we make a decision. Then the next section is Paul the Encourager, chapter 27. We're in Acts 27, verses 21 through 44. So let me start reading it. Verse number 21 it says, But after a long abstinence, Paul stood... Um, okay, so... You know, the, the, the ship had gotten into trouble, right? Verse 20. Did I read that far, didn't I? No small tempest lay on us, it says in verse 20, and all hope that we should be saved was taken away. So they're in the middle of a storm now. And But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should, not, you should have hearkened unto me and should not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that will sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. When the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they were close, they were drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. When they had gone a little further, sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to go, about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said unto the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, That this day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried, and continued fasting, and having taken nothing, wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. When they had broken it, he began to eat, and they were all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And, and we were all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the forepart struck fast and remained immovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped safe to land. So Paul, the encourager, you know, remember Paul began the ship as a prisoner, but he ended up the ver join the, the journey as the captain, didn't he? He was calling the shots, and they were they were listening to him and obeying by then. They didn't listen to him at first, though, did they? And sometimes that happens in life, too. We don't want to listen to anybody, do we? We want to do our own thing. We want to do our, you know, we don't want any advice. Don't tell me what to do. But then after we've been through some storms and through some treacherous areas, and God softens us up a little bit, then we're a little bit more listen, you know, able to listen to counsel. And, and boy, if you're really stubborn like that, don't, don't, have, don't force yourself to go through the school of hard knocks, you know. Learn from somebody who's gone through that 
sea before and who's wrecked on that shore before and has seen others and learn from them and take, take you know, be willing to take advice from, from somebody that's been down the road before and a little more wise uh, because, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't want to go through that. You want to learn from others, trust me. And so sometimes a crisis like this, one of the things you're just life and death is on the line, people really show their true colors, don't they? What, what did the sailors do? They were about to get the boat, pretending like, the, oh, we're going to go mess at the front of the ship for a little while and get some anchor work done. And everybody, apparently Paul and everybody, the soldier and everybody knew they were lying. They were just going to get in the little, the little boat and go to shore and leave them all to die. And so the soldiers just, you know, cut the ropes on Paul's advice and let the little boat just drift off to sea and be never seen again. And then what were the soldiers? That was the sailors. They were pretty dirty, weren't they? What were the soldiers going to do? Let's kill all the prisoners. Let's just, you know, that way we won't be accountable for them anymore. And, and we won't have to worry about them escaping. Let's just kill them. And so, um, but Paul stands up and says, no, you know, everybody in, in the centurion, you know, you can stand up. No, we're going to let them all to safety. So, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes in a crisis you see who people really are, don't you? And so, you know, but Paul, you know, he shared he shared God's word with them there in the first, you know, verses 22 there. And, and said that, you know, that there, therefore stood by me this night the angel of God. And he, he told them what God's message was and shared the word with them. And that's what a good, you know, a, a good encourager does. This is Paul the encourager. He share the word. And then he warned them, verses 27, 32, what was going to happen, didn't he? He was a warning to them. And that's our job too, isn't it? To warn sinners of their of the what's going to come in the future if they don't repent. And so we need to, if we're going to be a good Christian, that's our job, isn't it? To, to warn them. If, if we shut up and we don't say anything according to the Bible, their blood's going to be in our hands, isn't it? Like a watchman on the wall. And then he set a good example. You know, he said, okay, you guys, you're all weak. We haven't eaten anything in 14 days. And you can you imagine how weak you would be? So he said, now, now let's go ahead and eat and uh, it takes a meat to strengthen ourselves because uh, the Lord saved us and we're going to have to exert ourselves. And then literally rescued them in the last passage there, verse 39 through 44, uh, by not, not allowing the treachery of either the sailors or the soldiers. And so, you know, he, he was a, a good leader, wasn't he? He was a good encourager. And, you know, you, you see some parallels here in the same sea. Of, in, the, in the Old Testament of Jonah's ship, don't you? They, you know, Jonah was running from God, and he was disobeying the will of God, wasn't he? And so, uh, you know, that's when the storms usually come, is when you're out of God's will. Would you agree with that? And, and that, that's no fun to go through that. It's, it's a lot better just to stay in the Lord's will, isn't it? Than to get far away from Him and have to face that chastisement. And then, like I said, the, the, the storms have a, a way of revealing your character. You know, you see storms happen in people's lives. Sometimes they'll run back to God and, and God, I'm sorry, I want to get right. And then sometimes they'll even run farther away, won't they? And, and get even worse. And sometimes God has to do even worse, you know, even more chastisement and bigger storms in their lives. You know, come back with some of their true Christians. And then, you know, even the worst storms, though, they can't hide or hinder God's purposes. God's, God has a purpose for your life. He's got a plan for you, and, and it's great. He wants you to do great things and, and wonderful things and reach, you know, you know, you know, high. He's got high expectations and goals for you. And so don't let little storms and tempests and crises and, and troubles in your life keep you from God's purpose in your life. Always get back with Him, get right, fix the problem, just keep pressing on towards that mark of the high calling of Christ. Amen. And then a lot of times storms will give you an opportunity to serve others. Have you ever been going to encourage somebody that had been through something really hard? You know, our community lost a couple of teenagers, you know, in that shooting at Catfish King. And I noticed one of the dads on Facebook got on there and said, you know, people have been asking me and asking me, what can we do for the family? You know, what do you... Is there anything we can do? And he said, the one, and, I, and I've thought about it, and here it is. The one thing I want you to do is to make sure you're saved. Make sure if something happens to you and you die, that you're absolutely sure that you're going to go to heaven because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
And I, I know this guy not really well, but he used to manage at Ford, and he's our customer. So I know him a little bit. And I didn't even know that he was a Christian, you know. And I thought, wow, what a witness. What a powerful witness for Christ. God used that tempest in his life. A lot of people are looking at his family and at him, and he used that pedestal, temporary time of his life where everybody's attention was on him and his family to just shout out the cause of Christ. And, and I think, I mean, that has a lot better chance of people really listening, really getting saved if it's during a difficult time like that and during a terrible, fiery trial than at other times. And so it gives you, a, sometimes if you go to a storm, it, it gives you a chance. What I was about to say is, have you ever gone, and you, and you want to encourage somebody that maybe they've lost a loved one and they've gone through a tough time, and you go and sit with them, and, and all of a sudden, they're a big blessing to you instead. You know what I'm talking about? Has that happened to you? That's happened to me many times. And, and God is using that trial and storm in their life, and they're, they're standing up like a, like a warrior, like an awesome Christian. And they're turning that into being a blessing to other people. That's sometimes what trials will do in your life too. And so um, let's let's just you know um, keep keep on that path the Lord has us. Amen. God had promised Paul, Paul, I'm, you're going to be a, a witness for me in Rome someday. And God has always kept His promises, isn't He? And He's got some great promises for you. Amen. There's crowns waiting for you, and there's uh, you know a, a wonderful home in heaven waiting for you. And just remember all this storms, that's just temporary. That you know, that's gonna go away. We're gonna get past it. God's gonna get us past it. So keep pressing on, amen. And stay with God. Alright, let's let pray to you. Thank you, dear Lord, for your word today. I pray that you help us be an encouragement for us and pray that you bless these families, Lord, that lost their their children and, and having such a hard week, Lord. You just lift them up and with your comfort and grace and I pray that you bless the new baby in our church, and we're so thankful for baby Genesis. I pray that you bless her and bless Johnny and that she's recovering and, and the family. And would you just put your hand today on our services? We're thankful for your presence, Lord. That's the best thing about today. We get to be here in your presence. And I pray that you help us to, to listen to your word and be encouraged by worshiping with our other faithful brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you've got a few minutes.